Hey Vanity Fair, I'm Miranda Lambert, and today I'm breaking down six pivotal moments of my career. This is Kerosene from the CMA Awards in 2005. It was, you know, one of those things where everybody kind of knew when my team, like, this could set you up for the rest of your country music life. Like, I needed to nail it. <laughs> I really needed to nail it. My whole family flew into New York City for that because it was such a big moment in my career. I was terrified. I mean, I really hadn't been on television besides Nashville Star. I hadn't performed on an award show ever. And not to mention the whole audience, half the audience is country music heroes of mine. So. It was definitely very intimidating. And Madison Square Garden. <laughs> I mean, how many more things can you stack on that to make it so nerve-wracking? I'm nervous performing on television, but I just try to think of it as, just go do what I do. I do one thing, and when I get all freaked out about what it is or who the audience is, I just pretend that I'm up on a stage at Billy Bob's and doing what I do, and it does calm me down. We didn't have a harm anyone that played harmonica when I cut that song, and we knew we had to do it live, so my piano player learned how to play harmonica. <laughs> That's what you do when you have a small budget and a small band. Everybody plays everything. And that was some intense, intense pyro. I didn't plan on stomping around, but I couldn't see my band, and I didn't have a guitar, so I was like, I guess I'll just rock out. <laughs> There was a wall of fire between me and my band, so I was like, I'm just gonna dance like a crazy person, see if that works, and it did. I knew I got it right when I called my mom, because she's really honest. She judges my music like she judges my jeans, and she's not afraid to tell me if it sucks. <laughs> he slapped my face, shook me like a rag doll, don't that sound like a real man? I'm gonna show you what little girls are made of, gunpowder and lead. My parents um, started taking in women that were victims of domestic violence when I was a young girl, and probably 12. And they were private investigators also my whole life. So I, I saw, I've seen a lot. I mean, I grew up really sheltered, going to church every Sunday and cookies after school, but I also was exposed to quite a bit of real life, you know. It's very heavy to come home from school and see one of your friend's moms at the table crying and my mom to say they're gonna stay with us for a little while. And it's a very real problem. And especially in a small town in the Bible Belt, it's a little bit shocking because you sort of live in Mayberry in your mind. You go into this little school and church every Sunday and Wednesday and then all of a sudden a bombshell like this is happening right down the road. I wrote of my friend Heather. She was a, a victim of domestic violence herself and she came through a lot in her life and so writing it with her was obviously like, I was 17 but I feel like I knew a lot more than a 17 year old about it at the time. Heather and I started it um, at her house and we didn't finish it because we were getting there with it but we knew it needed to be said like in a certain way because it was such a sensitive subject. My dad was also a police officer, so I grew up around guns and um, always knew about gun safety because I lived with a cop. When I turned 17, I went to get my concealed handgun lessons because in Texas you can carry. So when they were like taking all the guns apart and reading all the parts and studying, they had memorized every part of a gun, I was like, it kind of hit me. Like I'm 17 years old, here's my dad learning gun safety and just like two days ago I was writing this song with Heather and it all kind of came together in my mind because you know you hear little girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice but not where I come from and women come to me a lot and tell me how that song saved their life and gave them courage to get out and um, you know I, I feel like that was the point of it and to draw attention to something that's very real. Well awards are something in my household like with the CMAs and the ACMs we would watch like, religiously like I would always have my little yellow legal pad and my pen and like write down all the nominees and would try to guess who I think would win. I mean, I'm like a diehard country fan from forever. So I took it very seriously <laughs> as a kid. So the fact that I was even, oh, I mean, I set a goal when I was probably 16, like one day I want to win CMA Female Vocalist of the Year. The fact that I was even 
at the CMAs and that I actually won and the person handing it to me was my hero was like one of those things that doesn't seem real in the moment. Loretta Lynn is is a, a country music legend. She opened so many doors for all kinds for every artist, not just female artists, but especially female artists because she was singing and writing about things that weren't necessarily appropriate at the time, like for instance, her song The Pill, talking about birth control. That was kind of like not acceptable to like speak about and she just wrote a song about it and it's one of her biggest hits to this day so I'm just thankful that she was brave because now I can be brave. You get butterflies and excited waiting to hear if your name's called but being there in general and being nominated a category means that your peers appreciate what you're doing and it's like validates all of your hard work and all the miles on the road and all the sleepless nights and just it's a lot of sacrifice so having your peers recognize you for that is is the award itself actually that was one of those nights that i was floating for a really long time I, thought if I, could touch this place, I'll feel it. I was in a space at the time where i was getting pigeonholed a little bit for songs like gunpowder and lead and kerosene and i had one called crazy ex-girlfriend and a lot of my sort of fiery revenge songs were carrying my career at the time and i was worried about it because i'm also a sensitive singer-songwriter and I wanted to make sure that I had balance and House That Built Me came along and the first time I heard it, it just it floored me. The house where you kind of find yourself and you kind of go from being a child with all the wonder and dreams in your eyes and then sort of being a teenager and knowing about real life a little bit more it's those formative years that start to shape you as a human and I think the place that you spent those years and memories doesn't ever leave you and so those two writers captured, Alan and Tom captured that exact emotion in such a beautiful way. So thankful I got my hands on it because it's a career maker for me. The thing that's special about that song is that it feels like it's everybody's story. Um, and it definitely was mine. And so it's been one of the most important songs of my career. I think the line that means the most to me is like, my handprints on the concrete and the, my favorite dog is buried in the yard because that's like very real to me under the buried under the tree with the tire swing you know it's um the little details of the song i've literally put my hands in the concrete of the house my dad built so i just was like how do they know <laughs> they knew everything when i sing that song live people cry every night i cry about once every three weekends too i mean you'll catch somebody's eye and you just know that it's moving them so much you can't help it this is a music video for mama's broken heart 2013. Mama's Broken Heart is basically about a Southern Belle who has a terrible breakup and her mom is wanting to sweep it under the rug and act like it's not a big deal and this girl is just going batshit. Trey Fanjoy did my very first video, which was me and Charlie talking, and I had never done a video. I'm still terrified of cameras. And so I actually walked off the set. I was like, I'm not cut out for videos. I'm not doing this. I just want to be a country singer. I don't want to do all of this fluffy stuff. And... Trey just made me feel so comfortable. Like, I, she brought me, she came outside and talked me off the ledge. And, you know, so she, from the very first time I ever stepped in front of a camera, was sort of there to direct me and calm me down and make me feel comfortable, you know? And she still does that to this day. I'm usually a jeans and t-shirt kind of gal, but when it comes to, like, really creating a video for specific lyrics and a certain feel, I'll, I'll push the boundaries. We found this house in L.A. that was like, like the house actually looks like that. I mean, it hasn't been changed since like, I don't know, 1962. And it's just, it was beautiful and it was perfect for the setting. Lying in a bathtub in a, I was in a blue dress and smoking cigarettes. And I think that just represented an absolute hot mess. <laughs> and Trey had to light my cigarette because I wasn't a smoker. I'm better at it now, but I don't smoke still. But I did practice a few times. <laughs> Trey usually comes with the treatment and I sort of, I really don't ever have to tweak it at this point with her. She kind of knows me and what I'm willing to do. And, but I also am willing to push boundaries with her because I trust her. I mean, when she said, really, all you have to do is act crazy, I was like, oh, I got that all day long. <laughs> so I just acted like myself. This is Got My Name Changed Back by the Pistol Innies. Good Morning America 2018. I performed with Pistol Innies, my band that I'm obsessed with. And I hadn't done morning TV in probably like six years before that because I'm kind of a night owl. And I ended up meeting my husband. So I'm glad I got up early that day. 
hey thanks guys for listening to my going on and on about myself <laughs>